Welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Tom Gibson from the Committee to Protect Journalists. He is their lead advocate since 2017 in Brussels, covering the institutions of the European Union. Between 2014 and 2016, Gibson managed Protection International's Burundi and Congo desks, advocating for stronger state accountability for the protection of human rights defenders and journalists, as well as developing emergency responses and protection measures. Previously, he worked in Amnesty International's Africa program from 2005 to 2014, based in London and Nairobi, during which he mainly researched human rights violations in the Great Lakes region of Africa. You know about our three plus one format. Uh, you get three questions and one soapbox moment. And uh, I propose that we start with question one, which is quite broad, but you still have only five minutes to respond to it. And that is, what does protecting media freedom mean to you? Well, what does it mean to me? It's a very important question. Uh, if we take a step back, press freedom is about our access to information. It's about improving our access. It's about allowing citizens by receiving journalism to make informed decisions about their lives and societies, the things that matter. Um, journalism in Europe is also um, characterized at the moment, at least in terms of the discussion that's taking place here in Brussels around uncovering truths, uncovering uncomfortable truths that relate to financial crime or corruption. And again, being able to establish what these, these facts are helps us shape debate. It stimulates change in the long term. But press freedom for me is also about pushing for change. So making journalists um, safer for the future. This will then strengthen our democratic processes. It will help citizens engage with rule of law issues. Um, making journalists safer is termed enabling a safe space uh, here in Brussels. And what I try to do with my work is use the influence of the European Union institutions to make that change possible. My role changed a lot with the 2017 murder of Daphne Caruana in Syria, Malta and the 2018 murder of Jan Kustak in Spain. Both were investigative journalists who have been taking enormous risks to uncover corruption, financial crime, organized crime. The two had an enormous burden on their shoulders and they worked for the right reasons. They were working to uncover subjects of public interest. But there wasn't enough protection for them. And when they were killed, it shocked people. It led to a mobilization of what needs to be done in order to protect journalists who are working in isolated conditions, whilst at the same time they're taking such big risk. And round about the same time that the, the narrative in Brussels changed, people started to look at the thousands and one different threats that journalists have on a daily basis, the conditions in which they work. And the discussion focused on what needs to be done to make these journalists safer. If they're bringing us the story, if they're uncovering allegations of, for example, investment of EU funds, breaches of EU law, how can the institutions themselves better respond, better protect journalists? Because these individuals are, in essence, defending the EU's interests. So what needs to be done? And that has been the discussion that has been taken taking place in Brussels since then. And that's been part of my work in terms of advocating for change. The fact that you mentioned those two um, murders um, has shifted the conversation a lot, because I think for a lot of people, safety of journalists was more something that was either not in the EU or associated to war zones. And suddenly, I think the EU became a war zone for journalists to a certain extent. Um, I think that leads us nicely into the second question, which is what should the EU legislators do or do better to protect media freedom? Well, taking a step back again, 
If we look at what happened after the murders, we had the European elections of 2019. And I do have to spell this out because it's important to answer your question. Press region groups, including the Committee to Protect Journalists, we campaigned for the Commission to have a strengthened mandate to work on press freedom. And this was matched at the time by political will from the European Commission to act. And so the 2019 elections set out, for example, the European Democracy Action Plan, uh, which laid out priorities for the Commission to work on for the next five years, which then included uh, different ways uh, and measures that um, could be put in place to better protect journalists. Um, and these uh, measures were also, uh, they, they were articulated at a time when the European Parliament has been very engaged on the, the question of press freedom. So just taking a step back allows us to see that there was political support for reform of uh, press freedom around Europe. And we do have uh, some measures which I'm gonna talk us through. But answering your question is that we have the measures and we have the standards within uh, the press freedom community. We we, we're awash with different standards, both from the EU now, uh, from the Council of Europe. Um, but the question now is implementation. It's political will at member state level. So let's, let's just go through what a, a few of these things are. The European Commission, I should highlight, has made an enormous shift since 2019. Um, this is uh, an incredible change from when I first arrived in Brussels in 2017. When I arrived, I actually met um, a Dutch MEP, who's very well known, um, Sophie Interfeld, um, and we discussed what uh, uh, her plans for pushing for a rule of law mechanism. Now, this is a mechanism which was set up after the 2019 elections, which allows the institutions to create a dialogue at the council amongst member states mm -hmm. around the national rule of law uh, situations. Um, last year, um, we have been campaigning for the annual reports to include recommendations. These reports have a, a, a four criteria. They've got justice, corruption, institutional checks, and press freedom. Mm -hmm. So we now have these annual reports that are coming out. What we want to do is actually use these for national advocacy. They have to have uh, an impact on the ground for journalists. Mm -hmm. um, but we're just what it comes down to now is is member state buying for actual change. This is then matched with recommendations that have been coming out of the European Commission. Now, for people who don't know the difference in, in terms of like the, the, the types of, of legislative uh, proposal that the European Commission can put forward, recommendations are they, they, they're soft law, you know, they're, they're guidance from member states. And what we have at the moment is uh, last year we saw the journalist safety recommendation which again includes very important areas of uh, you know, uh, protecting journalists against criminal threats, protests, online harassment, threats to female journalists, protection against surveillance. Um, we also have uh, this year a 2021 recommendation to address strategic lawsuits against public participation. Now these are vexatious lawsuits uh, which are intended to harass journalists because they introduce very lengthy procedures, financial pressure, the threat of criminal sanctions, and they're a form of censoring journalists. Mm -hmm. So in essence, we have, we have these two recommendations, which, which are very important, and they, they, they cover a, a number of different areas for member states. But are member states actually going to act? What are we going to do with the liberal member states that don't necessarily want to be putting place measures that better protect critical journalists. What do we do with the liberal states that don't want to be seen to responding to what Brussels is telling them to do? Um, and so we, we have this challenge now about how we can take these standards and actually make them work at member state level. We also have uh, legislation. So we have um, 
uh, the European Media Freedom Act, mm -hmm. which um, we're going to see a draft coming out in September. We know that it's broadly going to be looking at the question of media capture. Um, but the question is, is how robust is this going to be? We know that the, 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 the questions on the table around discriminatory allocation of government funds to media outlets, mm -hmm. the taking over of media regulators by liberal governments, the control of, of public media. But when, when this gets to the council, how much is there going to be pushback from member states? How much is this text going to be watered down? We also have an anti slap directive, which is a little bit different to the recommendation because it's looking at civil cases in cross border, uh, sorry, civil cases in uh, cross border cases. Um, and the question is again, is uh, within the dynamics of the institutions, there has always been this pressure, this fight between Brussels and member states about how much. Uh, Brussels has. Traditionally, media freedom has very much been a competency of member states. Yeah. And so with these measures, the big question is, is how much power member states are going to give Brussels to ensure that these pieces of legislation are tough, robust, and more importantly, lead to actual change? I think the the key that you uh, the key element that you emphasize here is is obviously always the same regardless of the area you're looking at which is it's great to adopt laws but then you have to enforce them um, and and the second one I think is that constant tension between what can be done at Brussels level and what needs to be done at national level and there's not much point uh, adopting perfect legislation in Brussels if then member states do not do much with it and I think that that um, maybe also leads us to the, the third question, which is what are the pitfalls that EU legislators should avoid when trying to protect the media and our freedoms? Thanks. Well, I, I think we should focus on this question of what happens at national level, because this is going to be critical. And I think part of this is down to communication. Um, there needs to be a better engagement both between Brussels but also the press freedom community with the government ministries, res ministries res responsible for strengthening this policy and practice around media freedom and journalist protection. Um, how much engagement, for example, is there really on, for example, the question of national safety action plans between journalists on the ground and the respective government ministries? and Brussels and the press reading community. Um, and when, when we're seeing these national measures, it's also, it, it's essential that these measures trickle down to the relevant law enforcement bodies, that they're also known to um, journalists, that they're known, that they're also instrumentalized by respective judicial authorities, that, that they're measures which are operational, that they, they, they work well, people have trust in them. Um, and until we have that actual change at national level, which I think is around, as I said, communication and organization, the EU institutions um, uh, are going to be seen as an outside voice. And it's critical that we think about those national processes and how we can strengthen that engagement. Um, uh, and then, I think a, 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 another aspect in terms of communication and then organization is what I term the sort of Jekyll and Hyde complex of the EU institutions. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean that on, on the one hand, the EU is sending out a very positive message around reforms and what needs to be done um, and you know policy and practice that needs to be changed. But on the other hand, we also have legislation that comes out of the EU practice, which isn't always positive. When we look at the EU's overall protection of press freedom, it's actually a mixed picture. And so, um, for example, whilst the European Commission is pass passing or proposing uh, actions in the gender safety recommendation, 
that will better protect journalists against surveillance. At the same time, it is proposing to uh, undermine encryption in a very controversial draft piece of legislation to address child and sexual abuse online, which this bit of legislation has raised concerns that it will create more problems than it resolves. And again, encryption is essential for journalists in terms of being able to maintain safe communications, uh, build trust with contacts, uh, retain confidentiality. Um, another example, the European Commission is defending the rights of investigative journalists to uphold EU law um, when they're looking into financial crime. But there are complaints from journalists about the transparency of the institutions themselves, including around access to information requests. Um, we are, for this conversation, focusing nationally, uh, sorry, regionally uh, at the block at EU member states. But we do just, let's just touch on the international focus. And the reason why this is important is that um, it's essential that the EU avoids accusations of having double standards. Um, and this comes down to uh, if you like, the way that the EU is critical of those uh, autocrats, governments around the world that threaten press freedom. And what we see is that, and this is linked more generally to the EU's human rights policy, but it is important to say that the, the EU is, is more critical of some countries than it is over others. This is often, if we're going to be suspicious, um, you know, we, we can see that the EU does have geopolitical and trade interests that underpin its bilateral relations. Um, and this again is, is just sort of tying into this Jekyll and Hyde complex. When we're looking at the protection of journalists, when we're looking at press freedom, it has to be uniform. It has to be the consistent application of those standards. There can't be uh, the, the, the upholding of standards or criticism about a press freedom situation in country A and not in country B. And it's very important that the EU is seen as a global leader. And in order to do that, it has to be consistent in the way that it approaches these problems. So you're basically, um, your, your diagnosis is a form of schizophrenia with, with the EU in terms of having um, very diverse personalities sometimes on the same oh. issue. The, the way I would describe it, uh, another way, um, is, uh, you know, doing lots of positive things with the right hand. And then, you know, the left hand is, is doing, doing sort of negative things. And it, it's a mixed picture. And we have to be honest about that in terms of our advocacy. And the institutions need to be honest about that. Well, um, I think uh, we, we're reaching the moment of honesty that you will have towards the institutions. I'm not sure they will give you as much honesty back. Uh, it's, it's our soapbox moment. It's, it's your two minutes of, of fame <laughs> to deliver a message to the powers that be in the EU. Uh, you have Roberta, you have Ursula, strong women. Uh, and, you know, go for it. Tell them what you think with your very specific perspective of someone that has fought in, in different geographies for the rights of journalists, tell them what you think they should do. Well, my message to the President of the European Parliament and the President of the Commission um, would actually focus on the time once they've left office. And we already have to be setting the ground for the 2024 elections. Now, obviously, this will be a new commission president that comes in. But it's very important that we set um, press freedom as a long-term priority for the EU institutions, and that we do everything that we can to already set the groundwork for the next term after the 2024 elections, because we've seen great reforms that have been uh, started by the commission. Um, but the Commission will need a mandate to ensure that these reforms can actually take hold in member states. Um, it's going to be essential that we uh, set ambitious work plans, um, that we really think about um, targeted measures to protect journalists, that we consider discussions around strengthening the competency of the Commission, 
to intervene in press freedom contexts in member states. Now, what we've seen, for example, with Hungary, with uh, the closing of Club Radio, uh, taking them off air, is that the Commission was able to find ways of starting infringement procedures against member states. There's a question of allocation of EU funds. Now, obviously, this then ties in more broadly to the rule of law mechanism. But, it, you know, part of the dialogue and debate around press freedom will be around, will be focused, um, I would hope, within a strengthened rule of law mechanism um, that can engage journalists, um, where journalists um, are continuously and regularly thinking about how they can work with the press freedom community to um, advocate together to influence uh, governments to, to put in place these, these really concrete measures that are going to make them safer. More existentially, we have the question of the treaties which lay out how the EU functions. Um, who knows where this discussion in the future may go? Um, uh, obviously, what we would want is for Brussels to have greater power over being able to, to influence national press freedom contacts. Um, we hope, and I, I mentioned the rule of law mechanism, but you know, we are in, in, on a number of different subject areas, including slaps, um, including the question uh, of, of gender safety. We, we're seeing uh, the development of a sort of pan-European press freedom movement um, on different subject areas that really um, is indicative of the benefits that um, solidarity among civil society groups, the, the, the benefits that we can have in terms of working together. And so I would really push the institutions to help act as a platform for press freedom groups, for journalist unions, for media freedom experts, for all types of journalists, for freelancers, for investigative journalists, to help us work together and better communicate on policy and practice reforms so that we can actually in the long term protect press freedom because this change is going to be long term it's going to be continuous but let's try and make it dynamic let's really strengthen our engagement let's make it inspirational because ultimately we have to be in the struggle together and the institutions need to be with the press freedom community I think you 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 went beyond the two minutes, but I think also it it was worth it because there there's a lot of things that need to happen. What what I um if I if I were to summarize the, the complex things you said, I note more dialogue. Uh, I note a coherent vision of the EU institutions in terms of legislation so that they protect journalists, not just in sector specific legislation, but also in other legislation that they, they consider um, their, their uh, privacy and safety there too. Um, I also uh, note more enforcement uh, at national level and more dialogue uh, between journalists, civil society organizations and the national authorities uh, with the help of the EU institutions were feasible. And I hope that um, the institutions will take that on board. I think there's a willingness. I, I took your point on board about the, the change and the shift in Brussels, but now I think that that shift really needs to translate into concrete actions uh, for you guys. So I, you know, let's hope let's hope it comes uh let's hope as you stated that it's a long-term uh, action plan not just a knee-jerk reaction to to certain events and um i would say good luck uh in in the next years uh pushing the institution to do so and this is the beginning of a conversation so we're likely once other uh leg pieces of legislations come out to continue that conversation and to ask for your views Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Caroline.